Vietnam was going on at the time. Ah. I had a draft number of 69, and I always did want to fly. So the opportunity to get in the flying program came up. So I, when I finished college, I went down and joined the Navy so I wouldn't be drafted. Uh, Ernest Shackleton, 1914 to 1917. When I joined the Navy, I was not thinking of going to Antarctica. Men wanted for hazardous journeys, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. As you saw in some of those pictures, Antarctica is awfully unforgiving. <clears throat> that's just some of the pictures. Uh, that's the open, the sea with the ice on it. Uh, as you flew north to New Zealand, you may fly into a sunset. It was light 24 hours a day when we were down there. So you didn't see a sunset. Uh, we had two radios on the airplane, the C-130. And uh, if both of them were functioning, I could use one of them to call back to the States. And I did. Try to run phone patches. One of the problems I ran into, though, it only had one kilohertz steps. <laughs> And I'd hear guys call them CQ. And I'd call them. But they wouldn't change your frequency a half a kilohertz to come to my frequency. Go figure. Um, Antarctica is huge. And we would fly from McMurdo here at the bottom to South Pole to McMurdo and reload and go to McMurdo again and then back. Rickety rack to pole and back. Two, four out. 3-2 back. Clearance correct. Clear to take off. Um, areas of this have, we've flown over it, but there hasn't been research done out there. Uh, this is the first class section of the aircraft. Um, <clears throat> even comes with a reading light. <laughs> right up here is the galley. Uh, the story was that one guy uh, they passed over going from ensign to junior grade officer. Things happened to the kid. He just, he would make mistakes. Like he put a can of SpaghettiOs in the oven right there and didn't punch a hole in it. And when that sucker blew up, it blew the door off and scattered noodles all over everybody and they didn't like that for some reason. <laughs> Explosions on board airplanes just don't go well. But the, nine hours, like this, nine hours. And these people were happy to get it. And the ticket to get down there is, you know, four years of college and justifying why you should do it. Polar exploration is at one the most cleanest and most isolated way of having a bad time, which has been devised. It's, it is the f only form of adventure in which you put on your clothes at Malcolmus, which is some base down there, and keep them on until Christmas and save for the layer of natural grease on the body you find them as clean as though they were new. It's more lonely than London, more secluded than any monastery, and the post comes but once a year. As a member of Campbell's party, that's one of their research guys, uh, tells me that the trenches at, at uh, Yepres during the First World War were a comparative picnic. But until someone can come evolve a standard of endurance, I am unable to see how it can be done. Take it all in all, I do not believe anybody on earth has at worse time than an emperor penguin who spend their whole time down there. And it's minus 70 degrees there at the rookery where they stay there at McMurdo. So how in the world, why would you pick that? Well, my dad worked on airplanes uh, over in Italy during the war. He was a metal worker. So he'd patch holes. That's him right there, patching a hole in the wing of a B-24, his friend, John Zudip. And as you note, he was all into uh, grunge before it was popular. <laughs> uh, so I got in the flying program with the Navy. This is called the Dilbert Dunker. During the Second World War, they found that guys, if you, you know, engine blew up, whatever, you went off the plane into the water. When they'd go down and fetch the plane up, they'd find the guy, get, he got so confused and scared, he got turned around. His head's down by his feet. So they require that you go through this thing. It seems like you're about 60 feet above the water. You can see you're not. And they, you go zooming down this rack. It hits the bottom. 
you're strapped in with your five point hitch and you got a parachute and all that stuff and it flips upside down. Now you're hanging on your straps. Well, when I started looking at this program, I saw this thing. I couldn't swim across a swimming pool. I was terrorized. That scared me. And so every semester in college, I took a swimming class of some kind. So by the time I got down there, I could swim the whole length of the pool down and back. The second week we were there, they took us down to the pool and they said, swim down and back. And so I swam down and back. There was only two of us out of the class of 22 that didn't have to go to stupid studies to learn how to swim. And of course, I'm thinking, uh, Navy, boats, ocean, uh, maybe I ought to learn how to swim. Anyway, and then they'd, if, if you have a parachute, you eject and you come down. The parachute can drag you through the water. And if you don't know how to get out of the fool thing, it can drag you to death. You're like a lure on the end of the line. So this is one of the things we had to do. Uh, got commissioned as an ensign in the Navy. Then I got my wings. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah. And so Tim pinned me. Got you know, in the Lieutenant J.G. and ooh, whites. Aren't those sharp? Um, so this this is uh, where we where we stayed under the the. It's it's kind of like a walk-in freezer. Except it's backwards. You keep the inside warm and the outside is cold. But over time, the snow builds up around it. So the first thing you have to do is dig out your window because it's been down there for 20 years and the wood is so dry. If you had a fire, it'd go right up. So you had to climb out that plastic window. You could bust through it. Um, stuck in one of the airplanes, it says, Antarctic flying is hours and hours of boredom interspersed with moments of stark terror. Uh, this, the name of this aircraft, it was a, a uh, DC-3, C-47. You can see it's got three rockets going. Uh, this particular one was called Charlotte. And uh, they had stored it down there on the ice. They had drained the gas out, but the valve on the bottom didn't close. So during the, the winter, water or snow had gone in there, so the fuel system was contaminated. So they purged it and purged it and gas and purged it and purged it and then, and then they'd say, okay, we got it all fixed. And they'd take off and fly somewhere and then halfway there, pfft, the engines would die. So they'd land on the surface. It had skis. Another plane would come out and they'd dump out the old oil gas and dump in new gas. And it'd fly for a while and then they had problems. And this particular one, the guy was taken off and the uh, left engine died. So he pulled back the right engine, but left the left engine up. And then the left engine cleared. Boom! It took off, but the right engine he'd choked off. And so the plane tipped over the other way, and he broke six foot of this wing off right here. And he said, that's enough of that stuff. Shut everything down, taxied straight ahead. That was the last time they ever uh, used that airplane. They chopped the wings off of it and used it for a taxi. Just haul people around on the ice. Uh, you can see the problem here. This one is not turning. Um, that happened many times. One time we were flying from Christchurch to American Samoa. I was deadhead. I was going to take the second leg. And uh, I'm laying there in the rack in the back, you know, on the thing that they haul wounded people on. And I feel the plane go like that. And I said, ooh, ooh, that doesn't sound good. Pretty soon a guy came back and said, oh, Mr. Snob, we had sound yes, we had to shut down number four. Uh, fire indication. I said, okay, whatever. I've, we've flown quite a, while, quite a ways with just three engines. So they turned around at that point, headed back to New Zealand, and in 30 minutes, I felt it again. Uh, Mr. Snob, we just shut down number three. So you look out the window, there's two of them at parade rest on the same side. And I said, ooh, now it's getting interesting. <laughs> So you just got the rudder really cranked over to keep the thing flying straight. But uh, turned out it was there's sensors around the edge of the aircraft, uh, the nacelle on the inside, and the connector had gotten dirty and it said it was a fire indication. We didn't see any fire, so we didn't fire off a bottle. Anyway, so sometimes this one they were coming in at um, 
to rescue one of the other airplanes, and he let a wing dip and crashed it. I think this is the one. Maybe this is the one that taxied over a berm because he couldn't see it because it was ice fog. Uh, several times, we'd be out flying, and we'd come back and flying from Christchurch, New Zealand, to Antarctica. It's about an eight or nine hour flight. And you get the forecast, and you have people down there, you're talking to people in Antarctica. And they're saying, oh, the weather's clear, no problem, good, good show. You pass PSR halfway down, point of safe return, and they say, uh-oh, we're socked in. Well, you don't have enough gas to go anywhere. There's no place else. It's ice. The, the joke was, there, there's one parachute on board the airplane. But the, other, but, but the joke was that if we ever went down, the fight would be over the toolbox. Because laying, floating in the ice, you'll last about 90 seconds. If you're firmly holding onto that toolbox, you'll go right down. It's only 20 seconds then. Get it over quickly. <laughs> um, but what we would do, you would proceed down there. And when you get there, you'd make an approach. And to 300 feet and a quarter of a mile. And if you don't see the barrels lined up, now the barrels are an interesting thing. At the, you know, that, that thing I showed you there where we stayed in under, there's no toilet in that. But they put a, just a little building, right, that you'd walk through to get into the, the ice house. And they put a 50-gallon drum there with a little funnel. So in the middle of the night, if you had to go, you'd just go out to the funnel. If you had to do more than that, you had to go down the street to the, uh, to the head. Um, so when the barrel gets full, what do you do with it? It's a nice black barrel in a white environment. You line it up at the, as an arrow at the end of the ski way. <laughs> Makes a good radar reflector. Of course, if you come in low and you hit that sucker, it frozen. <laughs> so you come down, if you can't see the barrels, then you level off at 300 feet, then you turn to 090 and you got nine miles to get it on the deck. It's flat out there, well, kind of flat. And you pull back on the throttle and you ease down until you feel yourself on the deck. Then you turn around, you taxi back. You still can't see anything. So the loadmaster opens a ramp in the back. So he, he's this far off the ground, off the surface. And he'll call up and say, uh, we're not moving here. And you think you are because the engines are running, you know, and you're flopping back and forth. This here is Pegasus, the last 121 the squadron had. It crashed two years, three years before I got in the squadron. Sadly, I would have liked flying on that one. This is 917, crashed at the pole. The guy talks about it on the, the DVD. Um, I took this picture. I, when we got into South Pole, I talked to the guy. I said, who put that thing there? They said, well, we just drug it out of the way. I said, no, 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 no. Drag it right off the end, one mile off the end of the runway. Made a great reflector. Boy, you could see that thing from 40 miles out. Oh, there it is, you know, and you know, knew where the end of the runway was. <clears throat> this was um, 321. You can see right here, it's missing the propeller. One of the rockets, like you saw on this aircraft, came loose and went through the prop, and they said, eh, junk it. 17 years after the thing crashed, they went back and rescued it. Because you could spend two, maybe $3 million rescuing that airplane, putting it back in service, where a new one would cost you $20 million. It had been sitting there for, seven, er, for 17 years, well preserved. There they're digging it out. This one here, interesting story. I was on that plane 24 hours or 12 hours before this happened. Um, <clears throat> we'd flown out to Seipel, which is way far on the one side away from us. It's towards toward South America. Uh, Seipel Station, it was a listening station. Excuse me. They had a 21-mile antenna, and boy, did that show up well on radar. All you had to do is put a diode across the thing and a an headphone, and you could hear lightning storms thousands of miles away. Well, the electrical antipode, the opposite of that, was up in Canada, and they had another one, and they compared their data and all this stuff. I think there were three guys out there in this little, about the size of that outhouse there, that, that toilet, and we hauled them food and fuel and stuff. And we, when we were going to take off, the aircraft commander, a guy named Charlie uh, Miller, said, you know, we were empty at that point. We dumped fuel. We dumped, we had nothing. He says, you know, we haven't done a rocket takeoff in a long time. We ought to practice one of those. 
And I said, you know, that's a lot of work. <laughs> he was the guy that got to sit in the airplane while all the rest of us were out there loading those stinking things. In the, the engines, of course, are still run. You're standing there in the exhaust, you know. And um, so uh, he says, all right, give me a heading. And we took off and flew back. And um, we, uh, the next day, I went into pre-flight. And they said, nope, you won't be going. And I said, oh, what happened? And they said, well, it crashed. And what happened was they went out and picked up a traverse team from uh, French. We're doing a traverse at Magnetic South Pole, Dumont d'Urville. And after they got all loaded up, the aircraft commander, who happened to be the squadron XO, said, uh, we haven't done a rocket takeoff. Let's try one of those suckers. We, have, we, you know, we need to practice that there. So they loaded on the very same rockets that had been lashed down in the back of the airplane that we would have used the day before. Got going and then <laughs> fired those suckers off. One of them blew up right here and parts of it went through the prop and into the wing. So everybody got off. Well, this side of the airplane was gone, but this side, the engines were running well, the uh, rockets were still going, so the thing did a 180 before they got it shut down. They all got out, stood out here in front of it, and watched the wing burn off. <laughs> and then they popped out the emergency raft over here, because when you do that, you can get a hold of the Gibson girl. 500 kilohertz. They put this together and flew it out two years later. Uh, when you land, you don't know if you're going to go in a crevasse field. Um, See, you go through the Navy program, it's, uh, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt to prove it. Yeah, that one. And this one here, you know. How many of you know have been there, done that, that has this t-shirt to prove it? Thanks, Bill. Of course, then there's this one. Just love the smell of jet fuel in the morning. <laughs> So they taxi, what, what they did, another plane came out and they a D, uh, hauled a D4. They filled the crack and pulled the thing out and flew off. Tough airplane. This one crashed when they were rescuing uh, 321, but mostly it was boardroom. This is what the cockpit looks like. A column for every engine here. So you had four engines. This is what it looks like now. This is, this is 787. I mean, there's no clutter up there. It's, whew. and look at the size of the display. Look at the size of this little tiny, tiny, tiny compass here. And normally there'd be a weather right here, uh, a weather repeater right here. The nav had the other, uh, the controls for it. Now it's on the, it's on the display. For navigation, sunshots or? What? For nav. Oh, oh, I was going to bring my, no. I, I was a navigator. We did celestial. The only thing we had that Columbus didn't have was a chronometer. And <laughs> you depended on it. <laughs> I don't know how many sunshots I shot. What's that? Charts and a watch. Charts and a watch. That was it. And that's what we did. Um, that right there. I, had, I bought one of these after I got out for 65 bucks or something. Uh, I noticed on the latest version when I was up at um, Oshkosh, the uh, C-17 doesn't have a, a uh, periscopic sextant mount. Just, I mean, we were hauling stuff uh, all around. It, it, we were always flying the things. Uh, because it was light 24 hours a day, I'd end up flying at 2 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. The reason for that is then you could go to mid-rats, midnight rations, and then take off at 2 o'clock, and you'd bring the plane back, getting back at 2 o'clock, wherever you were going. Then the other crew would take it from 2 in the afternoon to 2 in the morning when we would take it over. And the plane was, you, you were always flying it. <clears throat> there was always stuff to do. That's the entrance to the old South Pole. Uh, this picture actually was taken in Greenland. And you can see this right here. Those are ice cores that we hauled to the University of New Hampshire, I think. This is called a James Way. They're all fit in a box. Those ribs have hinges, about four hinges around them, and they fold up. So when you open them up, they make an arc. 
And in the box, which becomes the floor of the James Way, are bats, kind of like insulation. And they snap on those things that go across the top. <clears throat> now, now, I understand that if you ever meet this guy, him having seen the bottom of the world, I'll bet you his hair is totally white, like the guy that in Coleridge's Ancient Mariner. <laughs> When we'd drop somebody off in the, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, he, didn't, he didn't have this. He didn't have a, uh, a 30S1 or 30L1. Uh, that was the only picture I could find that had the case. He'd have a, 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 a KDBM 2A2. And they'd call. They'd throw a wire out on the ground on the ice. It's a 10,000 feet. You didn't need a stinking tower. And... They'd put a generator over that way and the antenna over that way, and they'd fire up their 2A or 2. And as soon as they made contact to uh, McMurdo, <laughs> we'd take off and leave them there. And they had to set up their James Way and all that other stuff, and they'd stay there for three months. And after three months, we'd come back and pick them up. One other thing I did was ice sensing. As you note here, they turned the thing into a biplane. That was a 60 megahertz antenna. Looked like this close up. On the other side, you had a 300 meg antenna. That one is broken, yes. That's why I took the picture. Um, and you transmit a signal vertically. You'd get a return from the surface, but you'd also get a return from the bedrock. So we mapped Antarctica and also Greenland. I spent two months up in Greenland flying this same configuration for the Danes. They rented the airplane and all the rest of it, put all this recording equipment in the back. A 35 millimeter uh, camera exposed to the little tiny scope that was showing the reflections, and as they pulled it by, then they'd measure it and determine what the altitude was of the dirt underneath. We'd fly at 1,000 feet over the surface for nine hours. Uh, uh, <laughs> This is some of the traces that we did down there. Um, and this is what it looks like when you take the ice off. Some of it is indeed uh, below sea level. But there's mountain ranges that stick through. Most of the Antarctica is at 10,000 feet, which is a problem if you're going to have it warm up and melt. You know, people say, oh, is Antarctica going to melt? Well, if it's going to melt, the average temperature at South Pole is about minus 40. The warmest it's ever been recorded was minus 5. So if you're going to warm that up from minus 40 to plus 30, you're going to have to add about 70 degrees to the temperature of the world to melt that ice. Not a degree and a half that's going to happen if we continue to run our SUVs. So that's kind of a problem. Uh, you might melt some of the ice around the, the edges, and the interesting thing is they have found all kind of stuff, gold and oil and all that stuff down there. The problem is if you drill through 10,000 foot of snow, what happens when you hit the dirt? That snow at that depth and that pressure is a plastic. It'll shear your drill right off. And when you pull the drill out, boop, it closes up. There's no evidence you were ever there. So much pressure is at the bottom of that. Um, we also did it, uh, so this is what it actually looks like in Antarctica if you remove all the ice. This is what Greenland looks like. You can see it's actually a string of islands around the edges with the middle being below sea level. And that's what we determined from our testing. Um, that's me right there in the middle of that picture. <laughs> You never know what you will never be able to do again. Yeah, I mean, we did that, didn't even think about it. Um, just, oh, here's somebody making a rocket takeoff, smoke and everything. This is the admin, admin building there at McMurdo. It's on the dirt. This is the geodesic dome that was at South Pole. That's what Sestrugi looks like when the wind blows and bits and pieces of the snow breaks off. Uh, there's less moisture falling out of the air in Antarctica than there is in the Sahara. It is a desert. A cold desert, but it's a desert nonetheless if measured by moisture. This is Shackleton's shack there at McMurdo. We're actually behind it. 
And this is I may be the Beardmore Glacier. Now when you have that much pressure of the snow pushing down, as it flows toward the coast and it hits a mountain, what happens? It flows around it just like water. So you can see how it moved around there. Um, <clears throat> and then it heads out to the ocean. This, uh, the one woman said, oh, there's no life. No, there's school gulls, which is a big, big bird, big gull, seagull. Uh, they'll grab a penguin and just fly off with it. And the mama penguins, wah, wah. Um, this is the inside of the bachelor officer's quarters. That's that same picture again, a close-up of the James Way. This is an interesting picture. If you don't know, there is a cadre of folks that are convinced the world is flat. And this is the reason right here. They say, now there's all kind of secrets down in Antarctica, don't you know? There's UFOs down there, and the Germans set up a super secret site down there. And um, this is actually how the water keeps from running off because you've got these big edges of snow. And these people are convinced. I watched a couple of these things. And said, that guy's saying that with a straight face. I said, it's amazing. I mean, if you go out and start, and you look at those, you know, you look at those on YouTube, and then all of a sudden a whole bunch of other ones will come up, you know, they're the same subject that they find for you. Thanks a lot. But they think that it's flat. And they say, you know, right at South Pole, there's, a, there's an entrance to a UFO base. There's a no-fly zone down there. Well, nobody ever told me that there was no place to, uh, I wasn't, wasn't supposed to fly. We flew all over the continent. And now, uh, thinking about that, there might be an area that is no fly, and that's because they're looking for neutrinos. And they've built these huge lakes in mines, 5,000 feet or 600 feet, under the surface. Here, trying to find neutrinos left over from the Big Bang or something. Well, the problem is they didn't find very many. So they said, well, well, let's go down to Antarctica. There's less things down there. So they put these six posts, and you can say, just search on Antarctica and neutrinos, and they put these in, in an area. I don't know why they had to go as far south as South Pole, off to the side of South Pole. So maybe that area they didn't want people flying over. But by treaty, there is no military down there. I was not in the military when I was there. I was paid by the National Science Foundation. When we went wheels up out of Point Magoo in California, we were chopped from the Navy to the National Science Foundation. So technically, we were not, although it was still yes or yes or three bags full while we were down there, but <clears throat> we weren't technically in the military. Uh, so our only mode of communication was, in fact, USX. We had a 20-meter beam right here, and a uh, Mosley and monobander, and there's the building I slept in right there, and uh, that was the ham shack, it was the James Way. You put your name on a list, and he'd work through the list. One guy took that, he'd, he ran most of the patches through a guy in Ohio. So my fiance, who lived in Pennsylvania, she, at two o'clock in the morning, you get a call. You accept a collect call from a ham radio operator in Ohio? Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, how's it going, what's new? You know. So you had two minutes to spill your beans. And of course, everybody was sitting there listening to you. So you didn't get too personal. But um, of course, the middle of the night for her, monosyllabic answers. answers. Um, this is the equipment they had. And we ran it full tilt. Um, some of the pictures around, this picture is incorrect. That's actually a chin strap penguin. And that does not occur at McMurdo. You'll see that at the uh, Antarctic Peninsula off uh, Argentina. This is an aerial view overlooking McMurdo. The ships line up here and pump those tanks full of fuel so they keep from freezing in the wintertime. And occasionally you'd get to go to New Zealand. This is the park in the middle. Also, I spent a summer in Greenland doing the same ice sensing task. That's there in the back. And that's the C-130. Right now, this is 319. That's the one that had the wing. That wing burned off right there. Is now down in Davis Mothin. So it's in mothballs. They haven't chopped it up and made it into pieces. So if they wanted, they could go, see it's got skis on it. They could go and resurrect that aircraft. I have 1,500 hours between that aircraft and 320. Yes? Is there anything at the South Pole besides human fascination 
No. There's a post in the ground. You know, I showed you that you, you, yeah, there's a post. Uh, and the, that's the point it turns around. But if you were standing there and there wasn't the buildings that people have gone in and put, there is nothing to the horizon. Nothing. In the winter, in the, when it's dark, of course, you see the aurora austorialis, not the aurora borealis, the, the southern version of it. But that's the kind of thing they're studying. I don't know why they're still studying it here 44 years after I was there. But somehow they justify it. Any other questions? Yes. Any astronomers there? Oh, yes. Yes, they study all, but, well, during the summer, not so much. You have to winter over. And that's just, just an interesting mind experiment. Um, 30 years ago, they were talking, 20 years, 30 years ago, they were talking about the ozone hole over Antarctica. Oh, my goodness, it's the end of the world. Um, what causes ozone? The sun interacting with the oxygen in the higher atmosphere. So it breaks up O2 into O, O, and that attaches to an O2, which makes it O3, which is ozone. Right? So, uh, for six months out of the year, you can't see your hand in front of your face in Antarctica. Why is there any ozone down there at all? Let alone there being a hole. It was never a hole. It's just a thinning. So, it, in, in the sun just gets a little bit above the horizon. You could run around naked for a week and you would not get a sunburn. You'd get a frostbite, but you wouldn't get a sunburn. So, I mean, you know, you got to think about it. And, and they wasted a lot of effort in, on that. So, anyway, any other questions? I got a lot of other stories. <laughs> yes, Jules. Yeah. Uh, green species of plants and things like that underneath the ice. So this is consistent with what, what you're saying that there's probably a uh, forest underneath there. Well, that could be. Uh, when they uh, were drilling in Point Borrow, they found palm trees yeah. 2,000 foot down, buried in the mud. So yes, points of the earth were green at some time in the past. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, regarding astronomy, I have a feeling that a lot of times there's wind and snow and everything, so how would that be very conducive to looking at the stars? Well, yes. Um, one time I was flying between Christchurch and, um, or uh, McMurdo and Christchurch, and uh, what I would do is do a single heading flight where well, you determine the barometric pressure where you are and the barometric pressure where you're going to go, and from that you can determine what the average wind is between the two. And so I figured that out, and I figured eight, see, now if I flew straight toward Christchurch, I'd end 250 miles off. I'd miss it. So I crabbed in eight degrees to this side and took off. And we went over the continent. There was no wind at all. And when we cleared the continent, I, thought, and I was about 300 miles off, and I said, ooh, ooh, this one isn't going to work. When we cleared the continent, the wind rose. I had 37 degrees of drift, which for doing 270 was the true airspeed. That was 200 knots. You can see this, the white caps just blowing like that. And so we drifted back across the center line, and now I'm 300 miles on this side. And I said, uh-oh. Now I'm really in trouble. I knew where I was, and I knew where Christchurch was. And then the wind just pfft, stopped like that as we flew out of the, the hole, the tornado, whatever you want to call it. And we just pfft, drove right back, and it came out perfectly. So sometimes the wind and the snow blowing, it's blowing snow and ice fog is, the, is what obscures the horizon. Every weather report included surface definition and horizon. So if you're looking down from the aircraft, can you see the surface? And ice fog or blowing snow can obscure that. And the horizon is rather critical because it kind of blends in. If, if it isn't a sharp line, you don't know where the horizon is. Anyway, so sometimes it is totally motionless. There's nothing moving. And in, you know, when it, at that time, it's minus 90 in the middle of June. And... 
So yeah, great, great look at its stars. You can see the Southern Cross right there, just clear as can be. <laughs> so yeah, it's another question. So like I said, there's there's a lot, lot more stories, but we better call it quits. So thanks for coming. That's what I've got for today. Thanks, Charlotte. Yes.